Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Rabbi Sharon Braus is the founding and senior rabbi of ECAR, a trailblazing Jewish community based in Los Angeles. Since 2004, ECAR has grown into a diverse, dynamic, multi-generational community, one of the fastest growing and most influential in the country. Braus has been named the number one most influential rabbi in the U.S. by Newsweek's Daily Beast. She blessed both Presidents Obama and Biden at their national inaugural prayer services, and her TED Talk, Reclaiming Religion, has been viewed 1.5 million times. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and the Washington Post. A New Yorker at heart, Sharon has grown deeply enamored of the sunshine and promise in Los Angeles, where she lives with her husband and wonderful children. And full disclosure, she's a friend. And it's just a pleasure to see you. Congratulations. I'm so excited we are interviewing you on your the day of the launch of yes. your first book, yes. The Amen Effect. And that is the topic today. And I just want to read the uh, subtitle, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World. We were never more broken than we are. Yes, that's today. right. Sadly, that's true. Um, but I know you've been a busy rabbi, and your sermons go viral, and you're taking care of people. So why a book now? Mm. Well, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here with you. So thank you so much for having me and for reading the book. And it's an exciting day. Um, this book originated as a sermon that I gave 10 years ago on Kol Nidre at the beginning of Yom Kippur. And it was a sermon that had a transformative impact on our community in Los Angeles, on Icar. Basically, after 10 years of building and growing this beautiful, diverse, dynamic community that was really committed to reinvigorating Jewish spiritual and religious life and standing at the intersection of, spiritual, of the spiritual life and the work toward building a, a just world, I had this realization that I had never preached to my community about the fact that you cannot build the beloved community out in the world if you're not doing the work of building beloved community internally. You can't go out and build a world of love and justice if you're not treating one another in ways that are loving and just. And so I stood up and preached this sermon, essentially saying to people, our lives will be measured by our willingness to show up for one another in celebration, in sorrow, and in solidarity that we actually have to stand by and with one another in life's most joyous moments and also most painful moments. And of course, there are really good reasons why people retreat from each other um, in times of, gr of grief and pain and heartache. What are some of those reasons? <laughs> Fear? Terror, right. I mean, we, we, when we confront somebody who's experiencing a loss, for example, it reminds us and reinforces for us that we are also vulnerable and could experience a similar loss. And this is particularly true when it's a traumatic or tra really tragic loss. Um, we feel like it's an imposition. We feel like it's not my place to show up there or we feel like they're gonna have a thousand people there. What's the difference if I show up or not? Um, with joy, we also retreat from people's joy for other reasons. Maybe someone else's blessing makes me feel a little bit like a failure. Maybe it makes me feel like I don't exactly add up. There might be issues of jealousy. There might be issues of all kinds of reasons that we pull away. And so I believe that that contributes to what we're now in, which many people, including the Surgeon General and others, call a loneliness epidemic because we pull away from each other in moments when it matters most that we go toward one another. And as a result, we are just isolated. We are living in little isolated bubbles and we don't interact. There are studies now that show that 30% of Americans literally do not know the names of their neighbors living to their right and to their left and across the street. I literally did not know my neighbor across the street I for about- I that story. It turned out to be a scientist you had quoted. Literally some... quoted him on Yom Kippur because I was so moved by his study on empathy that I gave one year as a sermon. And then the next morning, because it had been Yom Kippur, I slept late. So I left the house early, a little later than I usually do. And so did he. And we bumped into each other and we both been living there all along, but we didn't know each other. So I went over to say, hey neighbor, and we started talking and he works in the lab that actually produced this study. So. We don't know each other. Um, and there, I mean, there are studies that show now that 20% of Americans, even before COVID, did not have a single confidant, not one person to share 
our deepest worry about the world, our deepest fears. And this is really problematic because we know that loneliness attacks the body. It makes us not just spiritually unwell, but also literally physically unwell. And I would, I would recommend if anyone hasn't yet read Dr. Murthy's book called Together, it's an He's extraordinary- the Surgeon General. The Surgeon General's book. It's an extraordinary look at what, what ex the toll that loneliness takes on our bodies. And my book, I, want, I see as sort of a companion piece to that. What about the toll it takes on our spirit? And what about the toll that it's taking on us as a people and as a, as a collective? Um, because there is a massive toll. It's doing real damage to us now. So when you talk about the amen effect, it's kind of the I hear you effect. It's the I'm with you effect. Yeah, yeah. You, you describe it as it's the sacred mandate to hear each other, to embrace each other, to love each other up, especially on the hard days, yeah. to say to one another, amen. And for someone who's like, doesn't know how to concretize that, mm. what, how would you say or practicalize it? How do you kind of live the amen effect? So first, I'm gonna take a step back and then I'll come to answer that question. The, the title comes from an encounter that I had with a young guy pr about 10 years ago, just before this sermon came out, about half a year before this, this sermon that I mentioned. Um, this guy was in his early 30s, absolutely brilliant, uh, hipster, atheist, young Jew. Met his, his father, who was his best friend, um, died very suddenly. And he was searching for a spiritual anchor. He was really unmoored and essentially came to me because some friends had said to him, well, why don't you say the mourner's Kaddish, the, the, the prayer that Jews traditionally say when we lose a loved one. And he made the mistake of reading the translation in English of the mourner's Kaddish, a prayer that's written in Aramaic. And it not only did not resonate for him, but it really, it really infuriated him because the language of that prayer is a language of exaltation, and celebration praise. of God. Yeah. And he did not believe in God, and he did not feel like celebrating God in that moment. And so he came to me really upset. And I essentially, young rabbi, you know, sat with him and gave him all the best explanations that I had learned in seminary about Mourner's Kaddish and how powerful this prayer can be, including what I felt to be really the most compelling argument, which is in our time of grief, this prayer connects us to generations of people before us who've experienced grief. And so it's contextualizing our sorrow in a landscape of human sorrow, which also builds resiliency and builds strength. He did not buy it. He did not like any of my explanations. He walked out of my office unmoved. And I, and I really knew that I had failed him. And I thought about it endlessly for the next many, many months. What? What is the tool that we can give people when they're struggling like this that can actually help them work through their grief? And then one day I was sitting in Shabbat services and I looked at the prayer and all of a sudden it clicked. And I realized that what this prayer was doing was inviting somebody whose heart is broken to stand up in, in a space in which at least nine other people will be there and just say out loud, my heart is broken and have this community of at least nine others say, I see you, amen. And then the, the mourner says another line, I, I'm terrified, I don't even know what life will look like without, the, without my beloved. Amen, we see you, a and your loss scares us, but we're not running away from you. And then again, I don't even know, I took three years, you know, I spent the last three years taking care of this person, and now he's gone, what does my life look like? Amen. We will be with you as you navigate this difficult time. And if you look at the traditional prayer, has the community saying, amen, 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 repeatedly. And I realize that what's happening is there's this amen effect that's taking place on our hearts, on the hearts of the bereaved and the bereft, right in the moment that we need it most. And what's most powerful about it is the community is not fixing the brokenhearted. The community is simply being present with a person who's hurting and saying, this is terrifying and we see you a and we're not running away from your pain. We're not going to abandon you in your worst moment. And so that, that I have then extrapolate from that to say, so how can we manifest the amen effect in other environments that are not in a synagogue, in a minion, you know, saying mourner's Kaddish. And the fact is we can do this in every 
single aspect of our lives. And at the end of the book, I offer a series of practices, one for each chapter, because uh, this, this, the book is really written in a very homiletical way. It's rooted in Jewish text. There are lots of stories. I hope people will laugh a little bit. I hope they'll cry. But I wanted people to then be able to operationalize this and say, how can I manifest this value in my life? How can I practice this so that it becomes part of me? And we can do this in a thousand ways. But I want to invite us to think about when we see somebody in the supermarket who's crying, we can turn away and retreat from that person in pain, or we can turn toward them and say amen to them and just say, hey, you know, it, it looks like you're having a really rough day. Do you want to talk about what's going on? And I know that that sounds crazy because in this culture, it is crazy, right? We don't tor turn toward one another, we turn away. But I think we need to build a muscle, a, a new muscle, that helps us turn toward each other even in our most pained uh, and trying times because we do have the ability to do that. We just don't have the practice. Can you mention your grandmother uh, now? Because yeah. I, she had sort of a simple mantra, but it's very core. Yeah, my grandma, Millie, my grandma Millie's mantra was, you go to the simcha. You go to the simcha, you go to the celebration which was literally she lived by this mantra. She and my grandfather lived well into their 90s. They were deeply in love. They called each other boyfriend and girlfriend until the very end. They had a really, thank God, a really beautiful life together. Um, and, you know, as I say in the book, they literally went dancing every night before dinner and they always had a doers on the rocks before. <laughs> and they had a good, they had, they had a good life. They showed up. They just showed up. And grandma used to say, if you would fly in, if God forbid it was a funeral, then you better get there for the bat mitzvah, which is like a terrifying way of looking at the world, but really motivating. And I thought about it many, many times in my life as I made the choice, like, should I go there? I'm really busy, you know, like, can I miss this wedding? And it's like, go, just go and show up. And then I realized over the course of time that my grandma's assumption was that you'd show up for the funeral but we don't necessarily show up for the funeral. I learned this from my rabbi, Marcelo Bronstein, who was at BJ for many years. And Marcelo, when his mother died, I had already moved out to Los Angeles from New York. And I remember thinking, I loved Marcelo. He's, I love Marcelo, he's my rabbi. He's got a thousand people who love him and are taking care of him. So like, of course I'm not gonna fly in for the funeral, but I don't even wanna call him, I don't wanna bother him. And so I wrote him a lovely letter and I mailed it to him. And the next time I saw him a few months later, Marcelo said to me, where were you? I needed you and you weren't there. And I was so shocked and mm. upset. I mean, we don't usually talk to each other like that. And at first I was very defensive, you know, and then I realized like, I have young kids and a community and I'm, you know, I live across the country. And then I just realized this was a gift that he had given me because we have to err on the side of presence. We have to actually show up. And if we can't fly in, we have to at least pick up the phone and call and, and let the person know that we're thinking of them. And for me, that was really transformative. I also realized in this time that this Mishnah, this ancient rabbinic text that I had essentially fallen in love with over the course of my early years of my rabbinate was exactly the lesson that my grandma and that Marcelo were teaching me. And so if I may, I wanna share with you, because the Mishnah really stands at the heart of the book and every chapter of the book looks at a different aspect or different angle of this text. So the Mishnah codified in the year 220 CE, fairly obscure. I've never heard anyone else teach it before. I encountered it when I was in rabbinical school um, by accident. And you were at Jewish Theological Center. I was at JTS, right? And what the text describes, by the way, I rem let me just pull back a second. Um, the, when I encountered this text as a young seminary student, I remember looking at it and not understanding it. And I spent quite some time analyzing this text and trying to figure out what was actually going on because it's buried in this fairly arcane section about the layout of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. I couldn't crack it, but I had this mysterious sense that there was something there. And so I literally photocopied the page, folded it up, put it back in my Mishnah and back on my shelf. 
Then I moved out to Los Angeles. We built the community. I had a bunch of babies. Um, we, I, I married people. I helped people through divorce. We buried people. You, we had, you don't personally marry people. You no, are I officiated. <laughs> I only you married, married one person. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to be clear. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, we had, a, we had some loss in the community, some tragic loss. And one day I pulled the book off the shelf and this piece of paper came out and I opened it up and I was astonished. It felt to me like it was the, the very essence of my grandma's rule and, and maybe the very essence of life. And so here's what the Mishnah says. And the Mishnah then becomes the, the foundation of each of the chapters of the book. That when in, in temple times, when Jews would come from all over the land and all over the diaspora, they would ascend to Jerusalem on pilgrimage. They would ascend the steps at the Temple Mount. They would go through this giant, beautiful entryway and they would turn to the right and they would circle counterclockwise around the perimeter of the courtyard. And then they would exit pretty much right where they had entered one mass of humanity. I always think about the Hajj. I think about Mecca because that's really where we have these images of masses of people doing this holy work together. Except the text says for the Avel, for the mourner, which I extrapolate in my understanding to mean the brokenhearted. Someone with a broken heart would go up to Jerusalem, up the stairs of the, the steps of the temple, but turn to the left. Mm. And they would walk clockwise and they would encounter every single person that's walking in the opposite direction. And when somebody coming from the right would see somebody coming from the left, they would stop and they would have to look into this person's eyes and simply say, ma lach, what happened to you? And the person who's coming from the left would answer and say, ani avel, I am a mourner. I am brokenhearted. I found a lump. My partner left. My kid is sick. I am lonely whatever the pain was that was in their heart. And the people walking from right to left, one after the next after the next, would answer with a blessing. May the one who dwells in this place bring you comfort. In other words, you are not alone. In your moment of greatest pain, you're not alone. And I realized that the rabbis were writing 2,000 years ago, but it is so profoundly insightful. They understood, they had psychological insight in writing this ritual, in, in articulating this ritual, that only now are we really able to understand that, that we tend to retreat from each other when we're in pain. We don't want to show up. We want to stay in our pajamas and curl up in a ball all day. And the text says, you got to go show up and trust that you will be held with care. And when we're okay and we're walking from the right and we're engaged in the sacred work of going to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is maybe the biggest spiritual event of our lives. The last thing in the world we want to do is go take care of someone who's struggling on the side, but that is the work of going to the Temple Mount. That is the spiritual uh, mandate of this ritual. And that's astonishing. I mean, the, the, the clarity that they had around what the needs of the human heart the counter instinctual nature of ritual to bring us into community with each other precisely at the moment that both actors in this drama don't want to be around each other, I think actually captures the very essence of, of who we're called to be um, in, in this time. It also strikes me, I, I love that story, it also strikes me that they're asking the person in trouble to identify themselves. Yes, yes. That you're actually separating yourself out. Mm -hmm. And that's something that in our society we actually kind of work against. Yeah, we do. And if we show up, we, we feel this pressure to be like everybody else, even when we're not. And so there's such an honesty here. It's like wearing a, um, a kriya, uh, you know, to having a torn garment or as some people do the, you know, the black ribbon right. now in America which I talk about later in the book, but the point of wearing it is to show on the outside to everybody who encounters you during your most intense period of mourning, I'm different from you right now. I'm not okay. And it's so courageous to say I'm not okay when we're struggling. And I, I mean, I, I literally remember a, a years ago, a dear friend of mine who was going through a divorce and she said, every 
She, she, every couple that she saw walking down the street holding hands, she just thought, my God, like what's going on here? It's a world of people in love and I am out of love. And I like people look at me and they think I'm just a person, but I know that I'm different from them because I am broken and they, they're having this experience that is counter to my experience. And I've so many times encountered people and I myself have been in moments where I feel like I'm not okay, but people don't know. And I, I need them to know so that they can help tend to what's broken here. So it's very, it's very countercultural what the rabbis are asking us to do. You talk about a, a child who was lost so tragically in a boating accident, uh, Giddy, I think is yeah. his name. Yeah. And it was one of the times I did cry in the book. Um, but just when something like that happens, for any of us as parents, we put ourselves in that story. Right. Just how do I get up again? How do I move through my life again? How do I not replay that accident? And if we only hadn't done this and done that, then he would be here. And just what I think you helped me with was just having the language for presence. It's not about figuring out how this, these two parents are going to soldier on, if that makes sense. So in this, this is a really beautiful, um, most wondrous child in the community and he, his fifth birthday was during Shiva. And it was incredibly tragic and his, um, and I remember, you know, going to the funeral and then it was in their Shiva, in their home for Shiva that evening and the house was already decorated for his birthday party and Giddy loved sparkles. And so there were, everything was, you know, sparkling in the house in preparation for this day. And his parents said to me, we're going to come on Shabbat so that we can say Mourner's Kaddish. And I thought, okay, we'll do what we do. We make space for grief. That's, that's how our community operates. And then realized that that Shabbat we were supposed to, we were planning to celebrate the bar mitzvah of another kid in our community who was an incredible human, this 13-year-old this boy who literally, this boy like, relished learning his Haftorah. I mean, he was this most <laughs> astonishing child. And I thought, this boy deserves a real celebration. But our community was experiencing a profound reverberative trauma. When something like this happens, just like you described, there's no way to even hear about it without then thinking, I am vulnerable. We are all so vulnerable. So we're both feeling grief for the bereaved family, but we're also feeling a kind of anticipatory grief for the, for the loss that we might one day have. And so how will, not only for them, but for the whole community, how will we hold joy for this other child? And I learned that Shabbat as the family came, the bereaved family came, and I remember seeing them standing there for Mourner's Kaddish at this beautiful moment of celebration for this other child who was being lifted up in the chair and having the greatest moment of his childhood. I remember thinking, can the walls of this room actually hold this much joy and this much pain at once? Is it possible, like, are the walls themselves gonna collapse? And they did not collapse and we held the space and our hearts did not collapse and we were fully present for this bar mitzvah kid and we were fully present for this family. And I realized that that is one of the great spiritual calls that we are called to be honest about our grief and about our joy and, to, and our hearts are capacious enough to hold it all that we actually can. And so not running away from, the, from Giddy's family who n desperately needed us. They needed our amen, even though their pain hurt our hearts on multiple levels. And not running away from Nico and his family who desperately needed us to sing Simon Tov and Mazel Tov and lift him up in a, you know, in a chair and dance around him. We can do both of those things. And I think if we're spiritually awake in the world, we must. Mm. Uh, you quote Abraham Joshua Heschel, and I just want to read it here. Every human being has a moment in which he or she sensed a mysterious waiting for him. Meaning is found in responding to the demand. Meaning is found in sensing the demand. There is a question that follows me wherever I turn. What is expected of me? What is demanded of me? Mm -hmm. In terms of the amen effect, is that, are you applying that to the showing up, 
the I hear you, I see you, the being there, is it, is it more than that? I, I think that people often ask this question, they come in for pastoral counsel and spiritual counsel saying, I don't know what my purpose is in this world. I feel so lost. I don't even know why I'm here. And what I'm trying to address in that chapter when I quote Heschel in chapter four is that our purpose may be discovered in actually showing up for each other in mm. ways that we cannot prepare for and we cannot predict, but actually just walking from right to left, going about our day, but then taking the time and being awake enough and aware enough to notice the bereaved person or the bereft person or the ill, somebody who needs our presence in that moment. And I've experienced it a thousand different ways. I mean, I have a friend who, who once shared with me a congregant who said, I will always love your husband. Do you wanna know why? I said, tell me why. And he said, after his divorce, he came to services and my husband went over to him and just said, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Like my husband does not remember this interaction, but he said, I'm so glad you're here. And I was shocked by that. I'm like, that made you love my husband? I mean, of all the things. And he said, you know, because I felt after the divorce, like I wasn't gonna have a home anywhere, like among my friends, in my, you know, in my synagogue, in my community, in my school communities. And then all of a sudden your husband just said, you matter here. And so like that, may have been my husband's purpose in the world, right? That may have been part of it. And I talk in that chapter about angels and the way that our, our Jewish tradition says that every angel comes into this world with one distinct mission or purpose. And could we envision that we ourselves actually have some mission or some purpose in the world that could be very subtle. It doesn't have to be something monumental that we'll remember or even necessarily know about, but that we have some purpose in the world that when we show up for someone else, it might just actually be the thing that convinces them that even after their divorce or even after their loss or even after their struggle, that they matter in this world. And it could have some, cause some fundamental shift in them and but let me just pause for a second, yeah. because if you look at the way most of us are living, we're rushing through our lives. Yeah. We're distracted in an instant. I don't worry about sitting in an airport waiting for a delayed plane because I have the world on my phone or my iPad. I can see anything, watch anything. There's a million news things coming through, articles to read. It's, I, I don't even need to talk to somebody the way I might have before in a waiting room. So this sense, I think of, and, and I know it's almost a cliche now that we're on our devices and that we are not stopping and we're not pausing. And in many ways you're saying our tradition runs counter to that, but it, it feels to me like the amen effect requires the stopping. It requires the like, is that person okay? And I'm just wondering if you see the realism of that. It's like, is it almost too late right now for us to, to have that, that shift in orientation towards someone who might need us. I think it's almost too late, but it's not too late yet, right? It's almost too late. And you're right, we never have a quiet moment. I mean, we, we, you, have to really, you have to really slow down in order to notice. I remember years ago, I was teaching at Icar about Moshe, about Moses noticing that the bush was burning and not consumed. And um, one of our Icar founders, Ross Levinson, I remember he raised his hand and he said, I wonder how long Moshe needed to look at that bush to realize that it was burning, but that it wasn't being consumed. Like he could see the fire, anyone can see a fire, but to see the impact of the fire, he must have had to really stare at it for some time. And I think about it all the time because we would not even notice the fire because we'd be looking at our phones. Or right? listening and, to the podcast. And then we, we might look up for a minute and see the fire and then keep walking or say, ooh, fire. But we wouldn't stop to wonder about the fire. And so, I mean, we need, we, every, people know and understand right now that we're breaking. We know it. I mean, we're desperate for answers. That's why there's a whole Shabbat manifesto. You know, there's the, the Sabbath manifesto. We're trying to figure out, we have cell phone sleeping bags. Reboot has pioneered some of this thinking. We're trying to figure out what is the countercultural response to this moment that we're in where the world, where we have access to the world at our fingertips, where we can touch everything and therefore nothing matters and we can feel nothing. And I believe that part of what we have to do is recognize that we are not 
going to find our way to each other if we're if we're racing around avoiding each other we have to slow down and so on shabbat last week um somebody came over to me and said there's a person in the back who's really weeping and i don't know what's going on but i noticed and i don't feel comfortable going over but maybe you should and so i went over and i just gently you know, put my hand on her shoulder and I said, do you want to talk? And she had just experienced a terrible loss and she was not a regular in our community. She came to basically be in community so she could grieve. And if that person hadn't seen her and stopped mm. and then told me, I wouldn't have, I mean, there's a room of hundreds of people, but that person needed to be seen in that moment. And so I think now in shul, when we're in Shabbat services, we don't have our devices out. We're not racing around. We're not listening to the headphone, the podcast while watching the news, while re, you know reading a book and finishing our email. So it, that's one of the mechanisms for slowing us down is going into spaces where we're going to be operating at a different pace so that we can actually see each other. And it is almost too late, but it's not actually too late yet because we can do this right now. We can literally decide right now you know, on my walk home today from work, I am not going to be on my phone. I'm just going to be present and see what's going on around me. And I share a story in the book about, at the end of this chapter about finding our purpose, I share a story about one of my beloved board members named Ali, who was out for a run one afternoon just before Shabbat. She didn't come home and her husband's like, that's weird. This is longer than her usual run. And he does the, he tracks her and finds her in the hospital. And so he doesn't know what's going on, putting pieces together, and it turns out she was hit by a drunk driver while she was running, and she was almost killed. And it's an incredibly miraculous story. This woman has like iron will. I mean, she is so strong. Thank God she's recovered, but they have three little kids. He's like racing out of the house that goes to find her. Anyway, it's so, <laughs> she, she, it turns out that she was saved basically by another guy who happened to have also been out for a run and witnessed what happened and went racing at the car. It was a hit and run. He went racing after the car that hit her. He stopped the driver. He said, you need to take responsibility for what happened. The driver stopped. He then went back, found Allie on the ground and held her in his arms mm. until the, until the, um, the paramedics came and spoke comforting words to her and said to her, I will not leave you until the help has come. And we realized as we were, we only learned this story many, many months later um, when she was able to read the police report. And she found out about this guy because she had no memory of anything that happened in this, uh, in this moment. And I really think that this could be the reason that this man is in the world so that he could be there at that moment and not distracted by whatever's going on mm -hmm. and not so deeply entrenched in some podcast that he doesn't even hear the sounds or see what's happening around him, but so he could run forward and encounter this person in her you know, most vulnerable state and just tell her to hold on and that she would not be alone until the help came. And I think he was the help. I think he was the reason that she survived in many ways. So, 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 Abby, there's one last piece to this, which is that the Hebrew word for angel is malach, mm. which is exactly, <laughs> I mean, it's a play on words because it's not spelled the same way in Hebrew. But that is exactly the question that we are to ask one another when encountering each other in the circle. Malach, what happened to you? And it feels to me like that can't be a mistake. That can't be an accident that when we see each other, we are called to ask each other, tell me about you, tell me what happened to you, what's your story? And that that's in some way the way that we embody the angel aspect of us. Like some part of me was put into the world right now to see you in your pain and, and to help you realize that you're not alone. And, and some part of you was put into this world so that you could see me and help me in just the same way. So you're a rabbi who is mining Jewish tradition, I think, extraordinarily. But it's a very universal application here. Yeah. And you and your rabbinate are famous for, and sometimes criticized for, not just worrying about Jews. <laughs> and 
this is particularly a moment, we're talking post October 7th, yeah. where people are kind of feeling like maybe we just need to worry about each other because other people aren't so worried yeah. about us. Um, and I would love you to just apply the amen effect to this moment mm -hmm. in that way and this difficulty. Uh, I just want to quote you, you have a line in the book, the call to awaken to the image of God, to the dignity of every person has been the driving force of my religious life, the very heart of my faith. Mm -hmm. And you've really lived that, but often it is, and you've preached that, and often it's the harder thing, frankly. But Salam al-Ohim is hard for a lot of people to suddenly see someone else, not, not have no compassion, but think they're not my family the same yeah. way. Yeah. Well, the tribal instinct is a biological instinct. I mean, we naturally are inclined to draw lines of connection to people who look like us, pray like us, vote like us, talk like us. That is a very natural thing. It can actually be a wonderful thing because we need connection and we need community and we need relationships. And it can also be a very painful and destructive thing because the deeper our connections to the people in our tribe, the more distant we feel to people outside our tribe. That is something that's now well established. And so I, people often hold tribalism and universalism as dichotom dichotomous. I really see it very differently though, because I, I, look, I speak a lot in the book about, um, about the, mor the, the mourning experience, because I think that this is some of the most powerful, uh, resonant Jewish ritual experience. And so let's just think about mourning for a moment when we are, when we've suffered a loss and we're in our most intense period of mourning, we go into Shiva, we go into the mor the house of mourning. And for seven days, we really don't leave our house. We go straight from the burial site into our homes. We are fed, we are cared for, we are surrounded by love. The only people who come into our space are people who are welcome there. Right? You're not supposed to agitate a mourner. This is not the time to mend old, you know, uh, old rifts. And there's a very powerful natural inclination to be surrounded by those in our tribe when we're in our deepest grief. But you can't stay in Shiva forever. And at the end of that most intense period of mourning, we stand up and we walk around the block. And that act of walking around the block is the reminder that there's a whole world outside of our pain. There are other people who are suffering and in pain. There are other people who are celebrating. Someone just fell in love. There are other people who are just living in the, mundan the mundane, you know, everyday life. There's traffic, you know, like there, there are all kinds of things that are happening in the world. The, the trash wasn't picked up yesterday. And so what we're doing is essentially expanding the scope of moral concern from our own sorrow, the acute pain of our own sorrow, and realizing that the world is bigger than our own sorrow. And I believe that what's happened to many people in the aftermath of October 7th and the atrocities that were committed against our family is that we have turned inward. We have, have done what we naturally do when we grieve. We found each other in sorrow. And I have people who come to me and said, I have not been to synagogue in decades, but I felt this need to be among other Jews. And that's powerful. That's a powerful need. And, and, and I felt the same way. I felt this incredible comfort being surrounded by people who I don't have to apologize to for my tears when I just burst into tears in the middle of a meeting. And they're like, I got you, sister. I'm right with you, right? because we've experienced a great trauma and we're in profound sorrow. And at some point, we have to recognize that, that our sorrow is not the only sorrow in this world. And we will have to get up from our Shiva and walk around the block. And some people, it will take longer for them to do so than others. Some people are ready to do that sooner than others. But when we do, we'll see that there's a world of pain out there that we do not have a monopoly on human suffering and sorrow. We, the Jews, have suffered a lot, but we're not the only ones who've suffered. And my greatest hope is that our encounter with the darkness, our encounter with the great pain and heartache will soften our hearts to other people's pain and help us understand other people who are also in great sorrow and heartache, including Palestinian people who are suffering greatly in this moment. 
And I had this interaction with one of my colleagues and friends in Los Angeles who's very deeply involved in the multi-faith work that we do there. He's Palestinian American. And to be honest, we're very, we've spent 20 years building these very strong multiracial relationships, multi-faith relationships there. And we call each other whenever anything happens to our people. And we just reach out as friends and now loved ones over many years. And I didn't hear anything after October 7th. And it was heartbreaking. I mean, I felt like, <laughs> to, I mean, truly terrible, horrific things happen. And I'm devastated. And where are you? And I finally reached out to him a couple of days later. And he had just lost two members of his family in Gaza. And I realized he's also in heartache. He's also in profound pain. And can we meet each other in the grief? And I know for some people, the way that they're experiencing the pain of this moment would preclude them from seeing and experiencing the pain that others are feeling right now. So give it a little bit of time and be in Shiva a little bit longer and let our Jewish family feed you and take care of you and, and provide for you now as we continue to work through the shock and the horror of the atrocities of October 7th. At some point, we have to step out of that very tribal space while holding all of our tribal commitments, expand our hearts to recognize that we are also part of the human community. And that human community is bruised and bleeding right now, just like we are. And all of that matters. And that doesn't make us less committed to our Jewish family. I think it's actually the fulfillment of our Jewish core, uh, core Jewish obligations. So how do you talk to someone who says that amen effect is not coming back to me? No one's saying my non-Jewish allies or friends yeah. are not saying amen in my grief and my pain. And you're telling me to give it to them. Right. First of all, this is, we don't engage in the world conditionally. Mitzvot are not done conditionally. I will show up for your protest so that you'll show up for mine. I will go this way so that when I'm going this way, you will be that for me. We don't engage conditionally in the world. Our values are our values. If we believe in a just America, then we fight for a just America, not only so that our allies will fight for their, Jew for their Jewish you know, partners when, when the pain comes to us. We do hope, though, that they will. And the fact that many people did not was incredibly painful. And I've spoken a lot over the past several months about a kind of existential loneliness that I, and frankly, many of us, I think, have felt, which is, I marched with you, I fought with you, I stood with you, where are you? And I felt in the, in the past many months, I thought a lot about this book coming out in a time, it was written in a time, in which, frankly, many Jews in America felt like we were turning to the right and circling around from a relative position of privilege here. How can we be good allies to the people who are coming to the, from the left? What kind of policies can we advocate for? How can we use our platforms and our voices to fight for people who really need our support in this country? And then all of a sudden, October 7th happened, and we felt like we were moving to the left. And not only that, but many people from the right were not even noticing us or even were adversarial toward us, right? Even celebrating atrocities committed against our family. I think we have to speak really openly and honestly about that. It's very painful. And I wanna say that you did, and for those who haven't seen your October 14th sermon, um, which went viral, which I think is, is a must watch, but you, one of the lines in it has stayed with me. Our humble ask is that people give a damn when we die. And it was yeah. so basic, you yeah. know, and so tragic to me. Like, this is where we are. And, and, and so I, I'm pushing you a little bit yeah. because of the books, it, it, because I'm pushing myself to say when one feels like if other people are not going to care about our, us living or dying or, and suffering, it is a bigger ask, our empathy, which yeah. in a way is built into our tradition in so many places. Because our work in the world is to build the kind of reality that we want to live in. I quote Beria in the text. I quote Beria from, from the Mishnah. There's this incredible story about Rabbi Meir, the great sage, 
and his wife, Bruria, and Rabbi Meir is being tormented by these terrible guys out in his neighbor, neighborhood, Biryonim, they're called. And he comes home and he prays that they should die. And Bruria, his wife, who loves him and sees how he's being tortured by, by these guys every day, she says to him, essentially, don't pray that the sinner should die, pray that the sin should die, pray that they mm. should change, not that they should die. And she said, what she's essentially doing, she, and she quotes a verse creatively, because the natural way to quote that verse actually lends itself to Rebbe Mayer's interpretation, not to Berea's interpretation. So what she's doing as an interpreter of Torah is she's actually saying, I am not going to read the interpretation that will feed my worst instincts. I am going to read Torah in a way that will help me build the kind of world I want to live in and the kind of world I want my children to live in. And that means showing up because I want people to show up for each other in sorrow, in celebration, in solidarity. And if you don't show up for me, that doesn't mean next time I don't show up for you. That means I show up even more for each, for my, for my people and for everyone because I fundamentally want to live in a world where we take care of each other, where we love each other. And the fact that you don't love me back means that I need to put more love into the world and not less. Now, you can criticize me, as many people have, and say that's so naive. The alternative is to live in the world with no love, right? D to give up on the possibility of building a just and loving world. And I believe that our Torah says to us, that's not a legitimate choice. It says that we go out from Egypt and build a society of love and justice. Because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. The fact that people treated you so terribly is precisely what makes you go build a society that is antithetical to the experience that you have had. Because you know what it feels like to be cast aside, to be oppressed, to be forgotten. When you were hungry, nobody fed you. People created systems of laws that oppressed you. They hated you and they did not love you. So feed the hungry, create a system of laws that is equitable, do not hate, and in fact, love the stranger. And because you know the heart of the stranger. And so a few days after October 7th happened, several people said to me, so are you gonna go march at the next Black Lives Matter protest? Are you gonna go show up? And I said, God, God forbid, when the next unarmed black man has his life taken from him by law enforcement, do you think that a just response is, well, where were you when my people were hurting, so I guess that's okay in America now? Of course not. We want to build a world in which all people can thrive and live in dignity. We want to build a world of love and justice, and I will continue to fight for that world even if I am not held with love when my people are hurting the most. That's when I get held by my own people. And I'm going to continue to preach this message until it, until it reverberates out into our broader society. Speaking of being held, you have a chapter called Holding the Healers. And you are a healer. So what happens to you after all this holding? <laughs> um, how, how do you process it and kind of go another day and show up for another Shiva and the upside downness you talk about with so much of yeah. what you've had to, to face and be in the room for has to be depleting on some level. Yeah. I mean, for, I'll say two things. First of all, thank God for Shabbat. This moment. But you're working on Shabbat. Not Shabbos afternoon. <laughs> Thank God for Shabbos afternoon. No, I know. It's, this is the one day that we are supposed to step out of the world as it is and catch our breath and dream of the world as it could be. And it is the most stressful moment of the week for rabbis, which is a little bit unfair. But every Shabbos, I protect the space with my family for rest and for recovery and just to see them and and play games with them and sing with them and tell stories and read books out loud with them. That's what I do on Shabbat afternoon. So I, I try to never take a gig on Shabbos afternoon. Um, so thank God for that because we do need the time to do that. But the other thing is, I mean, even with Shabbos afternoon, I'm pretty, 
I'm pretty strong. I mean, I, I've been in the business for a long time and I've done a lot of really hard things in this work. And I thought I was really okay. And at some point it did catch up with me as I write about in the book. And there's a whole literature now around vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, and the ways that caregivers take grief into our own bodies. And as my sister Devora says, you know, if you don't metabolize the grief, it will metastasize inside your body. And it's just true. I mean, it actually, it happened to me. My body froze and I needed to be healed by another healer. And so I do feel this is a gift that healers can give each other to take care of each other. And there are some beloveds in my community who, you know, who will quietly come to me every now and then and say, hey, you know, I see what you're holding. If you can let me hold a little bit of that with you, mm. I would be honored to. And I've taken them up on it. I mean, this is not something that I would do, like share with everybody, um, but I do share it with some people because we can't actually take all of it. And I realized through my own moments of, of grief and, and hardship, and thankfully there have been, you know, only a few, but I did need to let people take care of me. And, um, and it's very hard for healers to let people take care of us. And when my father died just before Rosh Hashanah this year, I was a terrible mourner because every person that came in to Shiva was someone I loved. And I wanted to greet them all. And I wanted to, like, I'm so glad to see you. And how's your mother? I know she was going through our time. And how's your foot? And have you healed? And, and finally, my husband and Melissa, my you know partner in crime, Eddie Carr, and, and dearest friend, and they're finally like, Sharon, sit down and be a mourner. You're being a bad rabbi right now. You have to gr like grieve, and you have to show the community that it's okay to be taken care of right now. Let somebody put food in your hands. You're not playing rabbi right now. You're a mourner. Mm. So I was bad at it. I mean, it took, but I think this is also why it's many, many, many nights. <laughs> Because it took me the first several nights to be able to do that. And I couldn't even cry in Shiva for that reason. And I, I missed out on, I'm, I'm jealous for those days. I want those days back because I need to grieve for my poor father who died right before High Holy Days. For a pulpit rabbi, that's not easy. And then October 7th happened and I'm like, we're just swept up in this. And he deserved to be grieved fully and he hasn't been yet. And I, I regret that now. And so I, I feel we have to allow ourselves to just be held. Even the healers need to be held. Otherwise, the grief just lives in us and, and there's no way out. So again, my sister Devorah's wisdom, we have to figure out how to metabolize that grief. It has to move through us. Otherwise, it gets stuck in our bodies. So I'd love to end with this quote, which I love from your book. This, I believe, is the great question of our lives. When the night comes, who will sit and weep by your side? Who shares your worry? who will not be scared away by your grief, but will come closer. Who sees you and who do you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do believe this is the great question of our lives. And so much of our culture is oriented around us fixing what's broken. And this is such a deeper way of living that we're not called to fix each other. We're not called to heal each other. It's not magic. It's just about presence. Like, can we sit with each other in the dark? And thank God I have a few people who've sat with me through the darkest moments and who haven't been scared away, you know, by the, by the, the ugly sides and the, you know, the really, really honest sides. And I have people who I've really tried to do that with too. And I feel that that is also a message. Um, one of our community members who lost uh, a child in, in another tragic freak accident is the one who taught me this. And he said that he realized that people were encountering him hoping that they could take his pain away because the pain of his loss was so destabilizing for them. It's a narcissistic act actually. Like I don't wanna believe that I can live in a world where a beautiful, brilliant 20 year old can die in an instant. So I want you to be okay so that I can see that if God forbid such a thing's happen, that it's possible to be okay. But he said, I didn't need that. I just needed them to bear witness. Witness, not witness. And I don't think he created this phrase, but he uses this phrase now. 
And I love it. So I named the chapter in his honor, can we learn how to just be with each other in the dark and know that ultimately we will find our way through the darkness together and that there are blessings that emerge even there. And those blessings, in fact, are rooted in the, in, in the very fact of our presence, that we are not alone in the darkest moments. Rabbi Sharon Brous, thank you. Thank the book you. is The Amen Effect, Ancient Wisdom to Mend Our Broken Hearts and World. I hope you will read it yourselves and share it with the people you care about and hold. Thank you for being with us. I'm Abigail Pogrebin for In the Spotlight. See you next time.